So I'm thrilled to roll out the latest uh, episode of the quantum seminar series uh, dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. The seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time uh, right here on this channel and will be hosted on the Kiskit YouTube channel. After the talk is finished, so you can always go back and watch the talk. I'm excited to see so many of you tuned in already and uh, interacting with us in the comment sidebar. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing and hosting Vlad Sivak uh, for Michelle Dever's group at Yale University. Uh, hello, Vlad. Uh, how are Hi, you? Vlad. I'm pretty good. How are you? Great. Um, where are you tuning in today from, Vlad? I am in New Haven in Connecticut. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I spent uh, seven years in New Haven, so it feels like yeah. a second home to me. Um, and Vlad will share with us some of his very nice recent results uh, on uh, quantum limited amplifiers of a really new kind based on snails. And if you don't know what a snail is, it's, it's a very new, interesting element that is really worth uh, discussing today. Um, Vlad, I'll give a short introduction to you. And at the end of that, maybe we can pull up your slides and get into your presentation. Uh, and before I do that, maybe let me also reiterate that this is an interactive forum and an interactive discussion. So you can interact with Vlad and, and me in the comment sidebar and post your questions there. And I'll try to get to them during the talk. Uh, Vlad uh, did his uh, education at uh, Moscow Fistech before joining uh, Yale for his doctorate. Uh, he has uh, it's been in Michelle's, Michelle DeVere's group at Yale University now for some number of years and has really mastered snails and amplifiers and is doing some new pioneering work recently. Um, I guess a personal story I could share about Vlad. I think when, when I first met Vlad, it was pretty soon into his time joining the group. And I remember being uh, very shocked and impressed at the same time because he, we started talking about amplifiers and quantum circuits and pretty soon he pulled up this note he was writing for himself and it was already 30 pages long and maybe this was only two weeks into the whole thing. And he had basically at this point rederived all of quantum transmission lines and, and amplifiers, uh, but not even in the standard way. You know, I think he'd done it from a, uh, a path integral, like theoretic formulation with, uh, with the actions and, and the whole field theory approach to it. Uh, so I don't know if you remember that, Vlad, but, but that was that was perhaps the spur of the moment that led to even the work today and to us meeting on the seminar. Um, and we'll see what these amplifiers have to do with all of that. Um, so with that, um, I think maybe the main, uh, maybe I'll let Vlad uh, pull up his slides and it's about time we get started. All right, so can you see my slides? All right, I think we can, yes. All right, thank and, you, Zlatko. Uh, yeah, please uh, lead us through. And the folks, if you have questions throughout the talk, feel free to <laughs> post them. OK, hello, everyone. Um, so seeing my title, you might be wondering how snails are even related to these quantum limited amplifiers. Uh, so I hope to clarify that for you a little bit today in this talk. Uh, so this work that I'm going to describe was uh, done in collaboration with a lot of people, uh, mostly from Yale, but also from NIST. Uh, this is our group. Um, I want to say thank you to all of those who worked with me closely on this, and especially uh, Nick, Sham, and my advisor, Michelle. And to everyone, really, um, our lab is it's extremely collaborative and motivating environment. Uh, and I'm really honored to be part of it. <clears throat> OK, so let's jump right into it. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. Um, we'll first talk about why we uh, need these amplifiers for qubit readout, why we want them to be quantum limited, and what other properties of these amplifiers matter for us. Uh, and then we'll move on to discuss how to make these amplifiers with nonlinear resonant superconducting circuits. And I will focus on these resonant amplifiers because they are simple and we can understand a lot of the amplifier physics with them. Uh, but there are also traveling wave amplifiers, uh, which I'll touch upon only briefly towards the end of the talk. 
uh, and then we'll get to the snails. Uh, so SNAIL stands for superconducting nonlinear asymmetric inductive element. Uh, but uh, bear with me, I'll explain much better uh, what all this means uh, when we get to that part. Okay, so Benjamin explained all this very well uh, two weeks ago, uh, but I'll just briefly review what's going on. So this diagram here shows a simplified setup for readout of superconducting qubit. Hmm. Uh, so there is this room temperature electronics part, so the signal generator, digitizer, and so on. And then this part sits inside of the dilution fridge, and there are these various temperature stages. And the qubit and, it, uh, and its readout resonator, uh, they sit at about 20 millikelvin. And um, under certain conditions, uh, this system can be described with this simple dispersive Hamiltonian, uh, which has the qubit part, and the resonator part. And you can see that uh, the frequency of the resonator uh, depends on the qubit state through this dispersive coupling term. Uh, and this uh, provides a way to measure the qubit state by interrogating the resonator. Uh, and so we do this by sending this uh, pulse whose frequency is close, at, uh, close to the, uh, its carrier frequency is close to the frequency of the resonator. Uh, and this is a complex representation for the signal. Uh, so you can think about this I and Q as real and imaginary part of the signal. Uh, and so the signal is reflected off of this uh, readout resonator. And because of this dispersive coupling, the state of the qubit is imprinted onto the phase, uh, phase shift of the signal. And on the IQ diagram, um, this means that the, this blob gets rotated one way or another depending on the qubit state. Uh, and so by looking at this, we can define the signal to noise ratio, or SNR for short, as the ratio of this distance between the blobs to the variance of, of each blob. So then all this stuff is rooted through these circulators and into the amplifier. Uh, now the amplifier doesn't distinguish signal from noise, so it just amplifies everything uh, by a factor of gain, or this G here, but also uh, every amplifier adds uh, some more noise to the signal. So I'm representing this here with this increased variance of these blobs. And so uh, this means that the signal to noise ratio actually becomes worse. So why do we even need an amplifier at all? Uh, well, we need it because of what comes after. Uh, so in this following output chain, uh, the signal will be attenuated in the cables and in the microwave components. Uh, and also, because it's traveling towards uh, higher temperature stages, even more, it will pick up even more noise in the way. Um, and then by simply rewriting this expression a little bit, it becomes clear uh, that by blowing up the signal with this amplifier, uh, we, make it, we make it insensitive to all of these factors. So we can suppress them if the gain of the amplifier uh, is large. Uh, and of course, uh, in practice, we help ourselves more with uh, more stages of amplification. But in the end, uh, what we are left with is this um, added noise from the very first amplifier. Um, and it turns out that for phase-preserving amplifiers, there is a limit imposed by quantum mechanics on how small this can be. Uh, and it's equal to half a photon. And so amplifiers that achieve uh, this low added noise are called uh, uh, quantum limited. And for the comparison, uh, this uh, uh, high electron mobility transistor amplifier, which is commercially available, uh, adds uh, on the order of 10 to 20 photons uh, instead of a half. So this is a minimal degradation of the SNR that you can have. Um, okay, and so th since this uh, uh, signal to noise ratio is what we ultimately care about, um, let's zoom in on this formula and look at all these different factors that go into it. So, like I said, um, the amplifier needs to provide a large gain. Um, that's the goal number one. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an amplifier. Uh, we also want this uh, added noise to be uh, close to the quantum limit. Uh, another way to make this SNR larger is to use more, is to use more signal power. Um, but then the amplifier needs to be able to handle all of that signal uh, and still work reliably. So that boils down to this uh, question of power handling. Uh, also, um, we want all, everything in this formula actually depends on frequency. So we want all of these good things to be true over a wide uh, frequency range. 
So now the question is, can we, go, uh, can we get all of these good things at once? Um, are there some trade-offs or conflicts here in this optimization? Uh, and it will turn out that um, there is direct uh, trade-off, for example, between gain and uh, the bandwidth. Um, and maybe there is some trade-off between, say, signal uh, power handling and added noise. Like, for example, uh, transistor amplifiers at room temperature might be able to handle a ton of power, uh, but maybe they sacrifice some of the noise for that. So who knows? Um, so in our field, in our domain of, uh, uh, of these quantum measurements, uh, the quantum limited noise is a must, and we will then focus on optimizing, in particular, this power handling and the tuning bandwidth while preserving this property. And I should say that there are also many other uh, things uh, that come in, and I just uh, don't mention them for gravity. All right, so now we can uh, move on to this uh, um, uh, and discuss this question of how to actually physically make these amplifiers with resonant, uh, resonant nonlinear uh, superconducting circuits. Uh, so before that, let me just briefly explain what is this half a photon uh, of noise. Um, and to make a brief disclaimer, disclaimer right away, uh, this um, there, it is possible to amplify a single quadrature of the signal in principle without any added noise at all. And such amplifiers are called uh, phase sensitive uh, because uh, they select a certain quadrature. Uh, but I will focus in this talk on phase preserving amplifiers. Um, and so naively, um, one can imagine that the phase preserving amplifier does this sort of transformation to its input. Um, quantum mechanically, there is a problem with this, that it doesn't preserve the commutation relation. And so we need to modify this formula a little bit by including this uh, other thing, let's call it uh, some noise operator, which will absorb uh, the remaining part of the commutation relation and make sure that this A out commutes to one, similarly to A in. Um, so if we enforce this, uh, we will find that in a simple case, uh, this noise, op noise operator can correspond to a single extra mode, uh, which we'll call B in. And we usually refer to it as idler, uh, just because it doesn't do anything except for providing noise. And Vlad, just to clarify uh, a little bit for folks, I guess these A ins and A outs should be distinguished from the normal bosonic A's we talked about, uh, which refer to standing modes, uh, whereas here you're talking about the the flying photons, uh, that's why they have these subscripts in and out. Yeah, these are traveling modes in the transmission line. That's why they have these subscripts. And uh, in the, probably the next slide, we'll also see these standing modes, and we'll see how that is related. OK, so <clears throat> uh, now we can look at the variance of this uh, output. Um, and it's made. Uh, it has these two contributions. Uh, one, which is simply amplified variance of the input. So that's uh, what you would expect. But also, there is this other contribution from this noise term. Um, and the smallest this can be is 1 half. And that's essentially is when this uh, mode is uh, basically cooled down to its quantum mechanical ground state. And then this 1 half is simply zero point motion of the idle. And it can be more than 1 half if it's not so cold, for example. But 1 half is a minimum here. Mm -hmm. And this equation is remind me is this val is this valid for any state or uh, its operator level or is it valid for only classical Gaussian states? Uh, yeah, this is true for a, a, any state. Right, it follows from the commutations. Yeah, this is the symmetrized uh, variance, if you like. Mm. So it, it involves both quadratures. So even if one of them is squeezed because it's symmetrized, you will pick up more noise from the other. Mm. OK, uh, so how can we actually make such amplifiers in practice? Um, so we, can, we might take two oscillators at different frequencies. So these are now standing modes. And I will actually, um, I'm representing here the, these oscillators with the density of states. But I will also use this axis for spectral density and for gain profile. But that will be clear from the, you know, from the context. So, there are two um, key ingredients to making this amplifier, uh, nonlinearity and the pumping. Um, so I will be focusing on the three-way mixing amplifiers, meaning that this 
uh, nonlinear coupling between the oscillators is of the third order. Um, and there are also four remixing amplifiers. So this mode C can be some different mode that I'm just not showing here, but to which we will apply the pump. And the pump, it's a strong microwave tone. So you can think about this as uh, similar to DC bias in transistor amplifiers. Its role is essentially uh, uh, to be the energy source for this amplification. And this pump will create large uh, intra-resonator field. Um, and so we can replace the C operator with its average value, basically treated classically. And then uh, this mean field approximate Hamiltonian becomes bilinear. And we can compute the linear response uh, to the weak incoming signal into this um, mode A. So if the bias point uh, is chosen correctly, then the magnitude of this response coefficient can be larger than one, which means that uh, we will be able to amplify these small signals. But again, if we are sending uh, the signal at some frequency omega, it will be amplified in reflection. But it will be also mixed with this other contribution, which is the idler that we discussed previously. And so importantly, you can see that this, this response here is exactly that of the quantum limited amplifier that we derived in that slide about uh, half a photon of noise. Um, and uh, so note that here in this construction, um, the idler comes from a different frequency uh, and also different spatial mode. But it doesn't have to be different spatial mode. Uh, so, and these amplifiers that uh, use uh, two separate spatial modes for signal in idler are, are called uh, non-degenerate. But we can also make a phase-preserving amplifier uh, as a degenerate amplifier, which will have one mode like here. And in fact, this is how we made the snail amplifier. It can be classified as a phase-preserving, three-way mixing, degenerate uh, amplifier. So it also has this uh, third-order nonlinearity. Uh, and we pump it off resonance uh, near twice the resonance frequency. And that uh, produces a very similar response uh, to this case. Um, and the difference is uh, that this idler comes uh, now from the same spatial mode, although it's still a different frequency. So it's a, still a different traveling mode in the transmission line. Um, now, uh, both of these types of amplifiers, they have a problem that uh, this gain can be obtained only when the signal is close to the resonance frequency of the uh, amplifier mode. And that basically limits the bandwidth uh, of these um, amplifiers to the line width of the resonator. And in fact, um, in reality, it's even worse than that. Uh, and there exists this trade-off um, between bandwidth and gain. And so to, just to give you some flavor for these numbers, uh, for 20 dB gain, which is in linear units, it's a factor of 100. Uh, depending on the implementation, this bandwidth varies from something very small to uh, about 50 megahertz-ish. Um, so uh, let's now go yet to a lower level of abstraction and uh, look at how to, we can realize these Hamiltonians with circuits. Um, so here uh, on the left is the non-degenerate amplifier. So it has two modes realized using these uh, transmission line resonators uh, that cross in the middle where we have this uh, mixing element, which is based on Josephson junctions. And it's called Josephson ring modulator, or GRM. And the whole thing is also known as a Josephson parametric converter. Um, and here on the right is a much simpler circuit. Um, with a single mode, which is made nonlinear through this uh, other mixing element, which is actually the snail, uh, but we'll get uh, back to this uh, a little later. And so, like I mentioned before, the problem with these amplifiers is that they can give gain only near the resonance. And there is a way to circumvent this by making a tunable amplifier. So we create a, a knob, uh, which is the magnetic flux through the loops of these mixing circuits, uh, which will allow us to tune the frequency. It's very similar, really, how to how old um, uh, radios worked. Uh, in the old radio, the knob would literally control the capacitance in some resonant circuit, and then you can tune the frequency to the station that you want to listen to and selectively amplify uh, near that frequency. And here, our knob will control uh, the inductance instead of capacitance, and this way we will also be able to tune the frequency. Um, and so now, in addition to the dynamic bandwidth, we'll get this tuning bandwidth, um, which varies, again, um, depending on how you make these amplifiers from 
about hundreds of megahertz to about a gigahertz. Um, OK, and so here is an example of how uh, all this works in the JPC, which I've taken from this paper here. Um, so this is how they made the GRM. It has these four junctions uh, shown in blue. And then on this panel, you can see the resonance frequency as a function of magnetic flux. So you can see that it indeed uh, you can tune it with the flux. And then at each of these flux bias values, which are shown here with these rainbow cuts, uh, they could go there and further apply the pump bias and then show that this amplifier works, uh, that this device works as an amplifier. And uh, in fact, this device satisfies a lot of the good things that we want from an amplifier. Uh, it's near quantum limited. Uh, this particular device was adding two photons instead of a half, but that's fairly close. And uh, certainly future generations of GPC got much closer to this quantum limit. Um, it provides large gain. So you can see that uh, all these gain curves are above 20. 20 dB is not a magical number. It's just something that's enough for our typical setups to beat this following noise. Um, it has some bandwidth. Uh, 3 megahertz uh, is enough to do readout on the scale of about a microsecond, maybe not much, much faster than that, but that's uh, good enough. Um, it has a big tuning bandwidth of about 400 megahertz. Um, and then this compression power, uh, it characterizes roughly the upper limit to how much signal this amplifier can handle reliably. Uh, so I will make this statement uh, more precise a bit later, uh, but these numbers here, they are basically on the edge of what is enough for to do the readout of a single qubit. Okay. And Vlad, could you give us maybe the reference point for what a single photon of a typical readout, what kind of power you might expect? A uh, single at? photon is about this. Uh, if you convert it to, to these units, it's, it's going to be about minus 130. This range here is like 1 to 10 photons. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reason I was showing this is because it's all nicely characterized. Uh, and we will use this device as a baseline uh, against which we will compare the snail amplifiers. And so now we'll basically move on to the main part of the talk, uh, which is amplification with the snails. And, and I guess before we get into that, um, I know you. I know this is a talk about resonant amplifiers. When we, can you give us a little bit of context of resonant versus traveling uh, amplifiers? Uh, yeah, so um, traveling wave amplifiers are a little different from resonance. Uh, the idea there is that you have some nonlinear medium um, in which your signal propagates. You can make this medium, for example, with Josephson junctions. Um, and the signal is co-propagating together with the pump. And uh, if they are in phase with each other, signal can continuously suck energy from the pump. And this way, it will get amplified along the way. And so the longer the distance traveled, uh, the more it will be amplified. Um, so that's why they are called traveling wave amplifiers. Uh, they also don't, so these, the reflection, uh, sorry, resonant amplifiers, they work in reflection, meaning that signal comes in through one port and exits through the same port. And that's why we need all of these uh, circulators. Uh, here in this diagram. Uh, but traveling wave amplifiers, they would work in a slightly different way that the signal would come in from this port and exit from the other. So that's roughly the distinction. Right. And maybe jumping the gun a little bit, but to to the in my current knowledge, it seems like traveling wave amplifiers have achieved, you know, the gain, the dynamic range, the bandwidth, but the directionality seems to still escape them because of the almost inadvertent impedance matches. Uh, so they always yes. require an isolator uh, at present. Yes, yeah, that's right. So uh, you would imagine that because this amplifier works in this way, that you come in one way and exit the other way, then this will be a directional device. But you need uh, to have these circulators anyway, because uh, it needs to see a matched port. Um, and circulators provide this matching. So. It's not, in that sense, fully directional. Right. OK. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, in the very end of my talk, I'll compare snail amplifiers a little bit to this traveling wave amplifier. OK, thank you. We'll, we'll wait for we'll that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, 
this uh, story begins in the mid 60s um, with squids and slugs and we contributed to it more recently. Uh, so snail is, um, this is the circuit shown here. Uh, it's very simple, but it turns out it has some cool properties that uh, DC squid, for example, doesn't have. Uh, so there is one small junction here in one arm and then three large junctions uh, in the other arm. It doesn't have to be three, uh, it just has to be more than one. Uh, and uh, this circuit is similar to, for example, a uh, flux qubit, which had uh, uh, two junctions here, but it operates in a different parameter regime. Mm. It's also similar to uh, RF squids, in which this array is replaced, with, uh, sorry, uh, yes, the array is replaced with a linear inductor. And, and do you mean more than two in that left arm? Because uh, if it's just one, then it's just a squid and it looks like- Yes, it should be more than one. It can be two. Or it can uh, more be than three. one, yes. Thank yeah, you. more than one. <laughs> right. Uh, so we have this shortcut notation for it. And uh, so this phase phi is the phase across this element. So you can compute the potential energy of this uh, element uh, due to all these dressing junctions and the flux bias. And you'll find um, that it has this interesting property that it's actually asymmetric around the minimum. Um, and this is something that squid doesn't have. For example, if that's the case where you have one junction in this case, in this arm, you would have just a cosine. Uh, so it will be symmetric around the minimum. And, uh, um, and we realized that this asymmetry, it's a very valuable resource because um, if you expand yourself around that minimum, you will get all of these uh, odd terms, uh, which allow you to do three-way mixing. So if you've never seen the snail in your life, this is the snail. Um, the Josen junctions are uh, located here. And then to make an amplifier out of this, uh, we take we embed an array of these snails. So in this case, it's an array of 20 snails into in the middle of this microstrip transmission line resonator. Um, uh, so it's made of uh, aluminum deposited on the silicon substrate. And on the other side uh, of the substrate, there is a silver backplane, which acts as a ground uh, for this microstrip. And then this resonator is coupled uh, on one side to this uh, input transmission line through the finger capacitor. Uh, and this coupling rate kappa is going to be an important player. So I just want to give it a name right away. And then also on the other side, this resonator is coupled uh, to the pump transmission line through this weak uh, gap capacitor. And Vlad, this is very nice. Um, can you say, does the ground plane have to be on the backside or could you have the ground, could you make this in a sort of CPW oh, for geometry? Sure. Yeah. Yes, you could make it in CPW, in which case the ground would be here. Uh, is there a detriment to doing that, which is why you chose to do it the way that you're doing it here in microstrip? Uh, um, yeah, so it's, uh, there are definitely good things about that. It allows you to achieve much more compact geometry that way uh, because the ground plane is uh, much closer. Mm. There might be some problems with uh, bringing the flux into this amplifier that way. Um, I would say I, I don't see big obvious problems with this. And in fact, this is something I wanted to try, uh, but just never got time to do that. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, it's and, definitely and you say the, mm -hmm. nice. And you said the the backplane is not uh, superconducting. No, backplane is made of uh, silver, uh, which limits the internal quality factor of this. But that limits it to something on the order of a thousand. Um, mm. And this uh, resonator is overcoupled to the transmission line, so its uh, coupling Q is uh, on the order of ten to twenty. Uh, so that that loss there doesn't really matter. Nice. And uh, could you, you know, it's, could you comment also on the width of the traces? It looks like you have very high width. So I guess you're adjusting the impedance to something desirable. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter what is the impedance here. And we could make this with sort of large uh, capacitor pads. Um, this width is about 300 microns. Um, so the characteristic impedance here is on the order of like 45, 50 ohm. Mm. Yeah. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so, um, so this uh, structure gives us a mode uh, which is which inherits the nonlinearity from this array of snails, and we can write uh, the Hamiltonian of this system uh, like so. So it has these two terms that you can recognize as the good ones because that's what we used before to derive the degenerate uh, three-way mixing amplifier. But there is also all of these higher order expansion terms, uh, which, which are small, but turns out that they can still do some harm to the amplifier. Okay, so let's look at how these parameters uh, that go into this Hamiltonian depend on the magnetic flux. Uh, so first of all, uh, the resonator frequency, which is shown in red, uh, tunes in a range of about one gigahertz, which will translate later into the tuning bandwidth of this amplifier. And then uh, the coupling rate is on about uh, 200 megahertz. So that will translate into uh, dynamic bandwidth. And then this um, G3 nonlinearity is on the... Uh, uh, it's about one megahertz. And uh, we can note that it goes to zero here at zero flux mm -hmm. and at half flux. That's where this circuit is essentially symmetric. Um, and uh, this is exactly where we don't want to be because uh, we want to use this cubic nonlinearity to do the mixing in the amplifier. Uh, but as an example, this is where flux squid would, uh, flux qubit would operate uh, uh, because that's where the frequency is locally flat. So it's insensitive to flux noise. Uh, and lastly, this uh, fourth order nonlinearity, or also known as Kerr nonlinearity, is at five kilohertz level. Uh, and these two different colors are just two different ways to measure it. Um, and um, uh, importantly, there is a point where this nonlinearity goes to zero, it vanishes, and it actually changes sign from negative to positive. But because I'm plotting the magnitude here, it looks like it's coming back up. Um, and so this is a very interesting spot because uh, we'll see that this, this term is very harmful for the amplifier. So if we park ourselves at that point, we will get uh, improved performance. And, and Vlad, um, yeah. quick question. So I guess the star shift method of measuring G4 is looking, you know, you, you have, a, a, you measure the resonator frequency and you have a weak probe tone and you see how much it shifts and you have some way to calibrate N bar. Uh, the the cavity photon number. What what's the IMD method? I think that's a little newer to. IMD is called intermodulation. Uh, it stands for intermodulation distortion. Uh, so it's a method uh, which is actually used uh, to characterize classical amplifiers, and it's a proxy for how the amplifier distorts the signals and mixes them into other bands. So the way this method this measurement works is that you send two uh, probe signals um, and uh, amplifier because of this uh, kernel linearity can mix them and produce mm -hmm. sidebands uh, which are slightly spaced away from these two frequencies and then how much power leaks into that uh, sideband that's um, um, by measuring that you can in extract how big is your cur how, how big how, how big is the strength mm -hmm. of this mixing process I see and because yeah it's due to the fourth order curve mixing. And yeah. would you say that one is more accurate or easier to do than the other? Um, IMD is more versatile. It allows you to characterize any order of nonlinearity by just looking at different orders of sidebands, whilst mm. uh, the stock shift would only let you measure the curve. That's nice. Okay, um, so I already said many times that when you pump this thing, it will give gain. Uh, but so how does this gain depend on various uh, parameters? So here is the formula for gain. It has this uh, familiar coupling kappa uh, and also these other two parameters, uh, which are related to the pump. Uh, so delta is a pump detuning. Remember that we pump at twice the resonance frequency, so this uh, this this is going to be small, and this G is some sort of scaled uh, pump strength. Uh, you see that it's proportional to the cubic term, 
and also to this steady state amplitude, which is created inside of the resonator by the pump. Um, and so there is a divergence here um, when this pump amplitude balances this signal leak rate and the detuning. Um, and then by operating this device somewhere close to this, uh, what's called parametric instability uh, threshold, uh, where denominator is close to zero, that's, uh, that's where we will have large gain. And I haven't included the frequency dependence in this, but uh, you can include this and find that uh, this gain has approximately Lorentzian shape uh, in frequency. And then this expression is for the uh, top point here. And, um, and these results are very well known and agree well with uh, experiments uh, also for the JPC and other JPAs, for example, for remixing JPAs. It's very similar, maybe the exact expression for delta and G uh, differs slightly. So that's a nice formula, uh, but it's a linear response. So it doesn't depend on the signal power in any way. And so it can't be true for arbitrary strong signals, at the very least because um, of some like simple energy conservation argument that if your signal is already very strong, there might be not enough power in the pump to amplify it even further. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's also something known as pump depletion. Um, and so um, indeed there is this phenomenon of uh, gain compression, which basically manifests itself in the reduction of the gain when the input signal becomes too strong. And to uh, quantify this, uh, we can introduce this P1dB or 1dB compression point um, as the input power at which this uh, gain drops by 1dB compared to the asymptotic value. Uh, so typically um, this compression power is somewhere in this range. Uh, and for some best result you can, results you can find in the literature, it maybe reaches minus 110. And uh, these traveling wave amplifiers that Zlatko brought up previously, they can do better than this uh, and reach about minus 100. Uh, but um, until recently, it wasn't very clear what actually limits uh, uh, this power handling. And therefore, we didn't really know how to make it better. Uh, and there are several uh, mechanisms that can lead to it. Uh, as one of them is this pump depletion that I mentioned previously. But turns out that in practice, the most uh, important factor here is uh, this uh, quartic kernel linearity. So the way it works is that in the presence of the input signal, uh, there will be this AC stark shift of the resonance frequency, which is proportional to signal power and to this kernel linearity. And this will detune the amplifier from its operating condition, uh, operating point. And I want to point out that uh, you don't need to detune much because uh, you sit at this point where the denominator is close to zero. So that's a very sensitive spot. So even though this G4 is uh, very small uh, because the operating point is so sensitive, uh, this ends up being the dominant mechanism. Um, and so you can work out how this compression power scales uh, with uh, these different parameters in, in this case. And this formula informed us on how to change the uh, design of the amplifier to make it better for power hand. And so we fabricated several of these snail amplifiers that follow this optimization trend in which we increase, uh, sorry, decrease uh, G4 and increase the coupling uh, kappa. Um, and so this plot on the left uh, shows the compression power. So the higher, the better. Um, and the JPC here uh, from my previous slide is shown as a baseline. So in this first two devices, um, the big change that we made was to engineer the snail asymmetry, so the imbalance of the two arms of the snail, uh, in such a way as to suppress this G4 significantly. So you can see that the blue device was quite bad um, because it had uh, this large kernel linearity. Um, and in fact, it was undergoing this gain compression even for very weak signals that are at the level of quantum noise floor. Um, and then, um, oh, actually, I should mention all of these data points, they correspond to different uh, flux bias points. And that's why they're also all in different frequencies. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so you can see that this design uh, choice uh, boosted this power handling significantly and even already above this uh, baseline. Uh, and next, we settled on the design of the snail. Um, 
And we made a few devices sweeping this coupling rate kappa. Uh, so you can see that the G4 is now all, uh, the same for all of them, but the coupling is progressively increased. And then according to this formula, we see this further uh, improvement in compression power. And um, so this coupling kappa, mm, it's essentially the resonator line width also. So by increasing this, we also increase uh, the dynamic bandwidth, uh, which is proportional to that. Um, and uh, as an example, if you remember for this JPC, the bandwidth was about three megahertz. And for this red uh, snail amplifier, it's 45 megahertz. So that's more than one order of magnitude improvement, uh, which we essentially got for free while we were actually optimizing for power handling. Oh, that's nice. And I guess because your kappa is larger, you also have to pump harder. So in a sense, you're better off for pump depletion. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, in all these amplifiers, the further up you move this way, the more pump you will need. Mm. Yeah. Um, OK, so and then finally, there is this beautiful improvement uh, that one can get at the curve-free point, uh, which exists in these amplifiers thanks to the snail. Um, and so it wasn't so straightforward to find this uh, sweet spot because of certain dressing or renormalization effects uh, of this kernel linearity by the pump. Uh, so that's why you don't observe it in these earlier devices. Um, so this is a tricky effect that uh, I don't have much time to cover in this talk, but I'll just refer you to the paper if you're interested to learn more about this. Uh, and so... Um, Mm -hmm. And this is uh, something that you have to do at the design of the device level, right? No, it's it can be tuned in situ. Yeah, it's it's essentially there is a different knob. Uh, this this uh, curve free point sort of escapes from you from a, into a different dimension compared to if you only look at this uh, flux bias, and then you just need to employ that other knob to sort of go into that dimension and find it. So once you know that, how tricky is it to find that point? Um, in, oh, in well, uh, once you know that, it's it's easy. It's just a, basically a sweep of uh, pump detuning. Actually, that's the knob. Um, and then, uh, as a function, so here uh, all these points they are controlled by the uh, flux bias. Uh, and in this device, it's a little different. All these different points correspond to different pump detuning. And so there is this pump detuning where uh, you find the curve free point. Very nice. I have some backup slide for this. We can maybe talk about that if we have more time in the end. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe at the end of the talk. Mm -hmm. So uh, now it's maybe more clear uh, why I also chose to focus on three-way mixing amplifiers in this talk instead of four-way mixing, because um, in four-way mixing amplifiers, which are based on uh, some symmetric element like uh, DC squared or just array of junctions, you would use this uh, kernel linearity to do the mixing explicitly. You would use it to make an amplifier. And at the same time, you will be limited by the same thing in terms of power handling. And so by using the snail, that allows us to separate basically the roles of these two things. And the cubic nonlinearity is used for mixing, while uh, uh, fourth order nonlinearity should be suppressed as much as possible. And so uh, anyways, to analyze this, uh, to f f um, uh, conclude this uh, power handling, um, the take home message here is that uh, the spurious stock shift, which is caused by the signal photons, uh, leads to this gain compression in resonant amplifiers. Um, and we were able to gain basically four orders of magnitude here uh, and simply trying to suppress the effect of this uh, stock shift. Um, and so the next point uh, that I wanted to discuss is the tuning bandwidth. Uh, so you can see from this plot that uh, the snail amplifiers already have uh, a pretty good tuning range of about one gigahertz that's already larger than our baseline. Um, but can we do better? Uh, can we make an amplifier that works at um, any frequency, essentially, in the, um, in the band that circuit QED community uh, cares about, which is, say, 4 to 12 gigahertz? Uh, and so the answer is yes. Uh, this is how we'll uh, make it. Uh, so we will use this huge array uh, of 1,000 snails. Um, so this is essentially a nonlinear transmission line, 
or some people like to call it metamaterial, like Slatko mentioned before. Um, and, uh, and so it has a characteristic impedance of about 400 ohm. Uh, and because of this mismatch from 50 ohm input line, we can galvanically connect this array to the input line. And then this structure will support these uh, standing, re standing wave resonances uh, of this quarter wavelengths type, uh, which have a current node at the pump capacitor uh, and uh, anti-node at this uh, input port. And all of these resonances are slightly nonlinear, and they can be tuned in frequency with the, uh, using the magnetic flux. Um, and of course, we need to give it a separate name just because everything needs a name. So we will call it Josephson Array Mode Parametric Amplifier or a Jumper for short. Um, so let's look at the VNA reflection measurement uh, as a function of this magnetic flux for this device. So the color here represents the phase of the reflected signal. And we can clearly see that uh, there are multiple array modes, uh, which are spaced by approximately one and a half gigahertz uh, in frequency, unlike in the conventional snail amplifier, or more or less any other resonant amplifier, where you would only have one uh, mode in this whole range. Um, and the underlying idea of this jumper is to make this array uh, long enough such that the spacing between these modes becomes equal to the tuning range of each mode. And uh, this means that then we can hope to use um, this device as an amplifier at almost any frequency. Uh, so as an example, say you want to have gain here at nine gigahertz. Uh, then you can take this mode, uh, tune it to that frequency using uh, some certain value of uh, flux bias. Um, and then just treat it simply as a, a usual uh, parametric amplifier. So you can use this mode as signal mode, select some other mode as idler mode, and then set your pump at the sum of these two frequencies. Uh, and then it will work similarly to the JPC, except that in JPC, uh, the idler mode is a separate uh, microstrip transmission line. Um, and here, the idler is a, just another mode of, the, uh, of, of this uh, array. And alternatively, you can also use it as a degenerate amplifier if you treat this mode as a signal and idler mode. So uh, let's see how this works in practice. Uh, so in this plot, uh, horizontal axis is uh, frequency, and then vertical axis is gain. And in, in this top panel, you can see that uh, we can create this non-degenerate gain between multiple pairs, uh, signal idler pairs of modes at the same time. So here uh, the pump is set at uh, twice this dashed line frequency. And then this is one pair, a signal idler, that's another. And then in the bottom panel, you can see that we are also, we are also able to create a degenerate gain uh, in this middle mode and the non-degenerate gain uh, between this pair. And Vlad, can you comment a little bit on, so in the first, non-degenerate case uh, at like 5.2 gigahertz you also seem to be getting some sort of multi-mode looking thing is that yeah. yes 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 uh that you you can think about this as some other uh not so successful uh peak uh, which uh, is uh in pair with some other one which is not even on this plot because these mm. modes they keep going on up until like 40 more than 40 gigahertz uh so even there you can see maybe another one I see. And wouldn't, and I guess in a way, wouldn't you, I guess naively I would expect that the inner two, the closest modes to the omega p over two have the highest gain, but it seems like the second pair have, the, yeah, the two, the double triangle have even higher gain. Oh, the good uh, point. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, let me maybe go back to this slide. So uh, this is the gain as a function of pump power, essentially. And this uh, divergence happens at the point where this G balances uh, uh, coupling, more or less, and some other terms which are related to detuning. But yeah. uh, then what you really want to arrange is that this coupling of all of these array modes is the same. Um, and in that case, all of them will reach the same value of gain for the, at the same value of the pump. Um, and it happened to be so, in fact, for, 
for for this uh, array that the coupling of all of these low lying resonances is the same. Mm. So they all have the same language. And and the height of the peaks, it seems like it's a little taller on the outer peaks. Yes. Yeah, so that's basically uh, if there is a, some small mismatch in the couplings of these different resonances, then some of them will be taller, some of them will be lower. In this one, I think. Oh, in this one, the middle one is also lower. But definitely, I've seen examples where this is not taller, uh, and when you have some sort of decaying envelope like this. OK? Yes, thank you. All right, so, um, so this is a wide span uh, profile. So all of these peaks, they exist at the same time. Um, and these two are just different working points. So they correspond to two different fluxes, uh, flux biases and pump biases. And then we can show that uh, we, we can have something like this at almost any frequency. Uh, so in this bottom panel, uh, all these different curves, they don't exist uh, at the same time, but they uh, correspond to different operating conditions of this amplifier. So for example, this red uh, curve here, it's just a crop of this uh, upper panel. And similarly, that's uh, that gray one. Um, so we have seen similar plot before for the JPC, and I'll return to this data in a moment and compare it uh, to other amplifiers. Uh, but uh, before that, I wanted to show some more stuff here. Oh, and uh, we have a question I missed from uh -huh. um, the folks in the audience here. Uh, will the uh, relative uh, amplitudes change with small changes in pump frequency? Uh, I guess you. I guess that maybe the picture oh, these, shows that. Oh, uh, yeah. relative heights. You mean? Um, the, I think I think relative amplitudes means relative heights. Yeah, uh, for sure they will change and. Uh, I had um, like a certain tuning algorithm, which was uh, playing, you know, it was selecting different modes and then trying to place the pump and detune it left and right a little bit to adjust all of this uh, to make sure that it looks nice. Uh, but for sure, that's that's one of the knob that can make you uh, can uh, can help you make them all at the one level. Right. Good. OK. Uh, so um, at each of these uh, points, uh, we, character we characterize other properties of this amplifier, uh, such as uh, this 1 dB compression power, for example, which is shown in blue. Um, so this device uh, uh, turns out to be even better in terms of power handling than all those previous snail amplifiers that I showed. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason is because uh, having such long array allows you to dilute uh, the kernel linearity even further. So in this device, it was uh, this kernel linearity was uh, almost an order of magnitude smaller than in those other snail amplifiers, uh, and that's responsible for this improvement. And this basically shows uh, again that uh, not every optimization direction is in conflict here. That's we again we try to optimize here for the tuning bandwidth, but we also got this uh, better power handling as a bonus essentially. Um, then uh, the dynamic bandwidth, uh, which is shown here in orange, that's eleven megahertz on average, so nothing uh, out of usual. Um, and then uh, we have calibrated the absolute power at the plane of the device using short noise tunnel junction, uh, which was provided to us uh, by NIST. And this calibration allowed us to characterize the noise temperature of the amplifier, which is shown here in green. And so on this plot, the dashed line um, represents the location of the standard quantum limit uh, of half a photon. So it has a slope of one half. And you can see the jumper closely approaches uh, this quantum limit, which means that uh, which ultimately shows that we haven't sacrificed uh, in this whole optimization this most important metric for us, um, while at the same time made, made the amplifier much more versatile in other uh, aspects. 
Yeah, um, thank you, Vlad. And just uh, to give you a time check, we are coming up on the hour. We will, we're fine to go a bit over. Um, yeah, I have just one last slide. Oh, OK, wow. Uh, so uh, just wanted to show, uh, go back to this bandwidth question and overlay it with the baseline uh, GPC. So this rectangle here shows this tuning range of 400 megahertz. And you can see that this is indeed a big improvement uh, on the tuning range, which is combined with two orders of magnitude uh, improvement in power handling. So that's what this uh, jumper can, can give you. And uh, I also want to show uh, how it compares to the traveling wave amplifier. Uh, so this is another, I didn't discuss this much uh, in the talk, uh, but it's this another exciting direction for amplifiers. Um, and um, I explained briefly the principle, how it works, that you have co-propagating signal and pump waves uh, in nonlinear medium. Um, and so it has its own pros and cons. So uh, one of the big pros uh, is this huge dynamic bandwidth that it gives you at the same time. So now um, here, all, uh, all of these peaks of jumper, they uh, correspond to different operating points. But uh, this traveling wave amplifier gives you all of this at the same time. So actually, I should really compare it to this plot. Um, and that's something that would make you super happy in the conventional amplifier. Uh, but it's not so clear if this is something you really want for the qubit readout. Um, the reason is there is a lot of wasteful amplification of quantum noise here in this whole bandwidth. And then if this amplifier is not perfectly matched, um, uh, this amplified quantum noise can get reflected uh, and travel back to the qubit. And then it will look like your qubit is sitting in a hotter environment. Uh, so. In that regard, maybe having uh, a comb looking gain profile like this uh, can have some advantages. That's um, like a hypothesis here. Um, yeah, you mean if there's no isolation between the it between them, it will sort of spew back noise at the qubit. Yes, and uh, even if there is isolation, uh, this is a lot of the noise power here in this huge bandwidth. Um, mm. And also, it's it, this argument doesn't go only for noise. It's also true for signal. Uh, but that's that you can also apply that to uh, this this amplifier, which works in reflection. So it will reflect all of the signal power. Um, there are many of these interesting uh, com uh, comparison points for reflection and traveling wave amplifiers, actually. Yeah, um, I guess in the paper you had this interesting statement that you can because of the isolator, you know, if you need the isolator, you can, in a sense, almost conceptually, I guess, think of the traveling amplifier now as a reflection amplifier, just one that has uh, a broadband, like high dynamic range. Yeah, it's it's in a, it's a reflection in amplifier in the sense that you can't really operate traveling wave amplifier without these isolators and circulators. And then if you look at the setup that you will have inside of the fridge, it will be equivalent to the setup that you need for reflection amplifier. So in some sense, Tupa doesn't really provide you directionality. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that you, for the traveling wave amplifier, you would need to inject the pump to get and combine it with the signal somehow. So you would need to insert some other microwave components in between your qubit and uh, the amplifier, and that will introduce extra attenuation um, and make it look like this amplifier has worse uh, noise properties. And uh, also, it's actually not so clear how to make these amplifiers really close to quantum limit. Because in addition to that uh, directional couplers that you would need there, they are made because you need to match these amplifiers to 50 ohm. They are made with these large uh, parallel plate capacitors that happen to have a lossy dielectrics. And then part of the signal is simply lost inside of this amplifier. Uh, because of that. Um, and they have, at this point, they have some trouble reaching the quantum limit. But then this uh, jumper is, in some sense, like you pointed out, it's a not so matched version of the tupa because it has 400 ohm impedance while the tupa has 50 ohm, but they both have a couple thousand junctions. Uh, but in this case, we were able to show explicitly that there is no problem with reaching the quantum limit. Um, right. Because Because Impressed, well, I guess it's not designed for it, but in 
principle, you could open up your ports and try to make them 50 ohms on either side, right? And, and make it into a traveling wave medium yeah, in, with snails. In, 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 yes, yes. Uh, so this is some. This is one direction which we're pursuing now. Uh, try to make a traveling wave amplifier with a snail. In that case, oh, yeah. some some good things that you will have is in situ tunability of the impedance, uh, which was actually shown here for this traveling wave amplifier makes made with squids, where um, because you will be able to control the inductance with your flux, that will change the characteristic impedance. So you can, at certain flux biases, match this transmission line better to 50 ohm and minimize this uh, ripple effect that is here uh, in this mm -hmm. gain profile. And also, maybe you can then utilize the curve-free point uh, in such traveling wave amplifier to increase its uh, power handling. Right. and. Uh... I don't know if you're going to bring this up, uh, you know, face lips and, and sort of stability of the amplifier and so forth. Yeah, um, we never had any problems with face lips. Um, I don't think they matter here. And in any case, uh, they could introduce maybe some loss to the mode, uh, which would still be much lower than uh the coupling to the transmission line that we have which has a q of like 10. Mm. and for frequency stability they're okay because yes uh so uh, yeah that could be a concern that uh all these amplifiers that are uh, biased with the uh, flux uh they might have some jittery in frequencies but again because of the because the line width is so wide that jitter doesn't really matter much. Um, and mm -hmm. so we tested, for example, how if you tune this amplifier and leave it for several days with the same bias, how much your gain will fluctuate. Um, and it's a really small number. It's like less than a dB fluctuation, mm. which may be just due to just some fridge vibrations or something. Right, and but what about the phase of the vibration? Because that might mess up your discrimination thresholding for, say, qubit readout. Yeah, good point. Uh, good point. Uh, didn't look into that specifically, um, but I wouldn't expect that gi that gives something much more dangerous. Because uh, well, let me go to this slide. Uh, so ultimately, all problems. Uh, for the, these amplifiers come from this formula where the, the point where at which they operate is very sensitive. So uh, anything that fluctuates and change this, changes this denominator, which is close to zero, uh, that will cause the, the, the changes in gain. And so that can happen if your detuning fluctuates because of this frequency jitter, for example, um, uh, or some bad stability in the uh in you know cable rigidity so that the impedance fluctuates or things like that uh but that will have the same effect on the phase because phase is essentially like a uh, uh, also boils down in the end to this formula mm. okay nice um the, that's the king formula. It needs a, it needs a, uh, it needs a good name. <laughs> um, okay, so then I guess uh, I think I'm already over time, so I'll just leave you with that. Uh, and this is my conclusion. I just want to very briefly outline uh, some of the work that's going on in the lab now. Uh, so we have demonstrated that there is this nice improvement of power handling at the curve-free sweet spot. Uh, but that's just one point and also just one frequency. So we are we have some ideas on how to turn this into 1D manifold of curve-free points essentially, and then have this uh, nice improvement over a wider frequency range. And also, like I mentioned before, collaborating with NIST on the traveling wave amplifiers uh, with snails. Okay, uh, so I left some references here for those who are interested. Um, thank you for your attention. Sorry if I went a little over time with this.
uh, thank you, Vlad. No, okay, I have a little video issue, but uh, thank you, thank you, Vlad. Uh, there we go, there I am, sorry about that. Thank you, Vlad, uh, I, I can see already we have a lot of uh, questions here. Oh, Josh Combs was, uh, was on here, that's nice, hello, Josh. Uh, thank you also, Hani, and everyone else uh, for tuning in and for asking uh, uh, questions and listening in during the talk. Um, Vlad, I, I, I hope this was a good experience for you. Thank you for sharing the results. I'll also leave it to you if you want to say any final comments or take any final questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm happy to have questions. But otherwise, I just want to thank everyone for listening and thank you, IBM, for having me. Yes. Um, no, this this was good. I mean, quantum amplifiers are both essential for how well a quantum computer does perform at the end of the day. You know, there's this metric like the quantum volume. It also depends on how well how good the readout is, for instance. Um, but it's I think more and more crucial for doing some very cool fundamental physics. Uh, you know, in my experience, you really need an excellent amplifier that can you know reliably robustly per perform if you want to also start to do more advanced things like feedback and intervention back into the system and uh, and i think that's kind of where the horizon of a lot of what's going to come in the next you know five years is going to be is not just running passive circuits but also running active circuits with active feedback and and resets and so right. forth and for all of that you need really good amplification uh, but amplifiers as we saw from your talk have so many different conflicting demands and usually you can't circumvent around them but you know it seems like you've, you've been able to navigate that space and, and go through all the different different hurdles and um you know it's it's it seems it seems really promising so it's exciting thank you good and uh <laughs> yes uh, we do have one final question from bcw bcw i'm not sure who that is uh Sorry about that. Uh, the question is, can we get these uh, on Amazon Prime? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future. <laughs> Maybe in the future. I think for now, you just have to uh, look at Vlad's paper and uh, email him. Make one yourself, uh, yeah. Yeah, or make one yourself. <laughs> um, and I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for tuning in. I'd like to thank you, Vlad, for uh, coming to the seminar today and, pre and presenting your wonderful recent results. Say hello to everyone back at the old group. And uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next Friday. <laughs>